Hello everybody and welcome to a very special edition of Heated Shenanigans Podcast where I am joined by the king of Indiana himself, the legendary Billy Rock, as we travel back down memory lane and look over what has been an incredibly memorable career throughout independent wrestling and professional wrestling as a whole. Well, Billy, let's uh, let's dive in here. Where do you want to start this journey at? Uh, you know, I think we should just start from the very beginning and just, uh, we'll just go from there. We'll just win it. Walk and talk. <laughs> Perfect. Well, uh, let's hop in the, the time machine here, Billy. Let's take us back. Where did it all start for the great Billy Rock? So, uh, to look, uh, so just so some of your younger fans know, I am 47 years old. So uh, I was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s. And when we where I grew up, we didn't have uh, cable TV. I had, uh, we grew up with uh, just the standard five stations, but one of those stations, when the, the weather hit just right, got wrestling. And so my first introduction to it was uh, the build up to WrestleMania 1. Roddy Piper, and I actually saw this on YouTube the other day, but it was Roddy Piper, Paul Orndorff, and Bob Orton, and they're all sitting around some gym. All of a sudden, the the interview goes outside, and they it looks like they beat up uh, to to eight year old Billy Rock. They beat up a random guy just walking down the street, and I was hooked ever since because I was like, "What is this?" I watched it. Hulk Hogan, Mr. T was there. Mr. T was big for the A team, so that kind of all I, I wanted to know more about uh, professional wrestling. And then my dad would get me into. Uh, he would buy. PWI magazines for me. Uh, he had no clue about wrestling, but he would see it at the grocery store, and he's like, yeah, "I bet my son would like this." So he bought them for me, and that's kind of how that's how my love for wrestling more than other people because I was like getting magazines and not just the toys, but magazines. So I was learning about like Japan and Puerto Rico, what was going on there, what was going on in all the territories, while most people were just watching WWF at the time um, and my my I also was able to see NWA which was rare and I also saw UWF from time to time so I got to really watch all styles of wrestling fell in love with it and then from there um I once I graduated high school uh pro wrestling it reentered my life and uh, I'm I'm cutting out a lot of stuff just want to like not bore everybody with this whole story. And so um, uh, one day I was flipping through uh, a magazine. It's no longer around called Wow Magazine. I had an article for Dory Funk's Wrestling School in Florida. And at that time, uh, I thought that was um, also to the younger viewers. This was early 2000. So this is 2000, 1999, 2000. So the internet was still relatively new. Not everybody had computers. I did not have a computer. And the funny thing was uh, PWI used to have the uh, yearly guide to the independents. And in, in there, it had addresses to these independent promotions. So I would snail mail people saying, hey, like I wouldn't know about your training school. And I was going all around Indiana and uh, outside of Indiana. Uh, so I was snail mailing them. And I think I only got one ever response. And then like that was it. And so then that's when I saw Dory Funk's thing and, and wow. And I was like, okay, this is my foot in the door. To the younger viewers today, it's very easy to go on the internet, find a wrestling school, research it, do all this. Then it wasn't. So I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. So, uh, yeah, so then uh, I, I, I flew down to Florida for a week training with Dory Funk, not realizing what all was going to go into pro wrestling. Uh, it was, uh, we would work out in the morning, and for somebody who never bumped before, um, like, like after that day one, you could barely move, and then in the afternoon, you would have matches. So, technically, I had matches uh, my first week of wrestling, I, I claim... February 2002 as my first match, but I actually wrestled some matches in December of 2000 at the Funking Conservatory. So when you were gathering all this professional wrestling as a young Billy Rock, mm -hmm. do you think that's what helped go on to set you apart from so many other people in professional wrestling? Because you had studied a wider variety of wrestling. You didn't really like zone in like I'm only WWF. I'm only going to watch WWF. No, I, you would talk about Puerto Rico and all those other areas. I was curious, did that, do you ever think, played a role? Yes and no. I think some people, like, I don't want to say, like, I feel like knowing different styles, uh, 
I don't know. I don't think it did because there are some people that are just diehard WWF fans, and they've I've seen them like seen them get signed and move up, and you know then they start learning about other things. So, but I do think that it did help me um, just with me uh, as I got into the business. I do think that helped me because I had very I had I wasn't just going to be like what I saw on TV, I was going to see like what the Von Erichs did back in the day or something that I saw uh, Billy Robinson do in the AWA. Like, I do think that kind of helped me with what I was doing, but um, good question. It's a good question. Say, so when you, you finally got the response to come into a wrestling school and to start to learn the craft of professional wrestling at any point, in the training, as I know a lot of people, when they take those first couple of bumps the next day, you can't move, you're lying in bed, you're sore from head to toe, your hair's hurting when it mm-hmm. grows. Did it hook you then? D- did you know then that's what you wanted to do? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely it was. Uh, it was just the coolest experience ever. And really, like the, the Funkin' Conservatory, it's only a week long. So it's... It, it is a training school, but it's it's also just an ex, it's kind of like an experience, and so um, uh, that even I I I also I felt like cool, right? Like I'm like this is what all the this is what my idols all went through, and I was like yeah, um, and plus like the first time I went to the Funky Conservatory, they put you up in a really nice hotel, and so like like if you don't know Joy Funk, he trained at the Funkin' Dojo, which used to be. WWF's like developmental. They would they would bring people in. So like Kurt Angle, Edge, Christian, the Hardys. The list goes. He has a really big list of all the people he trained. So like in my mind, as I'm going on through all this training, I I keep thinking like this is what those guys all went through. Let's say, did you know going once you finished training? I should say. How long did it take you to adapt your style of professional wrestling? Because everybody's got their. Per- preferred style of a match to work and you by all accounts had one of the rare abilities to be put in a ring with anyone and you could match their style you were so comparable to a chameleon i would Mm -hmm. say being able to go in if you needed to work the bigger style you could if you needed to work a faster slower pace more methodical you were able to get in there and do those types of matches how long did it take you to start to get into that? A long time. Uh, 2002, I guarantee you, I didn't even know what I was doing that year. 2003, I started kind of getting an idea of what's going on. I would say everything started kind of clicking 2006, 2007. So when things started clicking and then perfecting was like 2008 and, and on. Um, but it took me a good four to five years to one. It took me a good four to five years just to find my style. Uh, I knew I was little. I knew I I was trying to be like Ricky Morton or Ricky Steamboat as the baby face. So I was learning how to sell, which was always a good thing. Um, but then like really what was my offense? Uh, it was kind of boring early on. And then um, I, I found out about Johnny Saint. I found out about Lucha Libre. And I was like, you know, I'm not super athletic, but I'm athletic enough to pull off this stuff. Like, if you ever watch Johnny Saint, like, he, like, it's just, it's not like they're real athletic moves, but they're just, they make it look like he's doing something really cool. And so I was like, I'm doing that. So I swear I kind of came up with my own stuff uh, by selfishly stealing some of his stuff and stealing um, uh, arm drags from from Mexico that I didn't think anybody was watching. So, well, Billy, they say if, if you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. If you steal from many, it's research. There you go. There you go. I stole from many, many people. And I think that's a uh, lesson for all young wrestlers. Uh, take from your idols, take from your heroes, people you respect, and then try to figure out what, make it your own after that. So when you got out on your own, you're you're out of out of training. You're able to go take bookings outside of the the company you're affiliated with. Who were some of the first people that you remember giving you the opportunity to come work? Um, so early on, it, 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 I didn't get many, and there was a reason why for that. So a lot of times, uh, in Indiana wrestling, I was uh, I wrestled for WCWO, 
uh, Don Basher's uh, promotion, the, the late Don Basher. And so you kind of get labeled as a WCWO guy. Uh, sometimes their style is more old school. And so, and I, and I was wrestling a very old school style, um, especially early on, like the, the veterans I broke into were kind of like the, the, the guys who did, um, late uh, or the eighties jobs for WWF and did some stuff with Dick the Bruiser. So I'd be wrestling them. So obviously they're not going to do anything from today's style of wrestling. And that's not a knock on them. That's just the way they, that's their, what they did, which was good for me because I learned how to sell and that was fine. Um, so, and then after that, it was, uh, Sean Laux and, uh, Sean, Sean, sexy Sean Cook and Guy Lombardo. They opened up Central Wrestling Federation and they gave me a lot of opportunities to, to be in the ring with people. They gave me a match with Spider Nate Webb in 2003 that, that was my first taste of, okay, I can do this super indie stuff. Cause that's what we, we did. It was super indie stuff with a little comedy thrown in there. And, um. Those, so they were really the first ones. And then, um, like, I kept wanting to go to Insanity Pro Wrestling, but they were like, you're too old school, we're new school. So really? They, yeah, so they never booked me. Um, so actually, it wasn't until 2005, late 2005, uh, Central, Central Wrestling Federation, I, I got with Sean. I'm like, Sean, I've got to put together a match where I just, we just, just, it's a spot fest and I show what, what I can do. And so we did, and we had, and I remember one spot was so, so complicated. And luckily we didn't mess it up, but we practiced it a billion times, but it was just, I wouldn't even do it today because it was just so much back and forth to where it's even ridiculous. And um, anyway, uh, that got in the hands of Ian Rotten. And IWA Mid-South was really the first, like, Indiana wrestling wasn't giving me an opportunity, but Ian Rotten, of all people, gave me my, like, he, he gave me my first opportunity by wrestling Matt Seidel for it, for IWA, which was a pretty big uh, independent uh, in back in 2006. I'll say circling back to the CWF days, that the roster that Guy and Sean had assembled, honest to God, I have not seen a roster symbol that could match what those guys had put together. It was you, uh, Dustin Lillard, Chad Collier, P.T. Hustler, Devon Fury, Kenny Courageous, the, the nucleus of talent that was in there. Mm -hmm. How many of those guys did you go out and seek and, and talk with? Like, Because they all had a different style and they all had different stories and ways to succeed in wrestling. Mm -hmm. So... Um... So I told you that I, I didn't know crap when I first started. P.T. Hustler and Devon Fury, um, and Sean and Guy did too, but outside of Lafayette, P.T. Hustler and Devon Fury were two guys that basically told me, okay, this is how we should do a match. And um, there's a billion ways to do a match, so everybody knows. But when you start out, I like to do one way, and then you can grow from there. So they they told me the basic way, and then um, so they were really helpful. Chad Collier, who I also claim really helped get me to another level. His was just his was way different. It wasn't so much teaching and talking. It was in the rain, and you better keep up with me, or uh, I'm I'm gonna hurt you. And so, like there was times I wrestled Chad, and I felt like I was in a fight, like a real life fight with the man. Um, he was safe; that he wasn't rough or anything. But he would lay in the chops, and when when uh, when he would go for a pin, he'd put all your his weight on you to force you to kick out. Um, so he would, and he got green Billy Rock. So I felt sorry for him. Like, so our feud in 2004, 2005, it was okay. I'm sure he hated it, but then it wasn't until 2007 when we met up again and had another feud. Um, that's when he finally gave me the seal of approval. Like, okay, you're, you've gotten better. So Cole Cabana was another one that helped me out a ton. Um, Cole Cabana, I wanted to wrestle. He, he had, we had the same styles. And so I, I became friends with him. He's an awesome guy. He'll help out anybody. Basic, but once again, back in the day, you had tapes, not so much of a YouTube video. And so I would mail him tapes or I'd give it to him at a show. He would watch it. And then by this time, I do have email. And so he would email me like probably 50 to 60 things I did wrong in a wrestling match. And it can be 
really like heartbreaking seeing how bad you are as a performer, but it helped me so much. So I took my like 12 to 24 hours of sulking and then I was like, okay, let's go down this list and I, I made changes on everything. And then I would see him again. He's like, okay, better. And then the list would start getting smaller and smaller to where, uh, just so also for young wrestlers, uh, I, I want to do a lot of teaching in this podcast. Please do. Uh, for young wrestlers, just because a wrestler will not vouch for you right away does not mean like they're giving up on you. So Colt was, was very honest with me by saying, I, you're not ready for Ring of Honor. You're not ready for Super Indies just yet. So, but we got to a point where he's like, you're ready. And anytime you want to go um, to these places, please let me know. So that's what I did. And that's, he was another guy who helped me huge in wrestling. So I, I had remembered an, another individual that you had great chemistry with, and I'm sure you learned a lot from, and that is Mike Quackenbush. Oh, yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, Mike. Um, so once again, um, it was um, that match was in 2006. I'm trying to remember my dates here. Uh, and it was like September of 2006 and IPW finally started booking me. And uh, they, uh, after Ian booked me, they were like, and I, and I got a please come back chant against Matt Seidel. They were like, Oh, I guess you can do some stuff. So they, they finally brought me in and, um, and I'm grateful. Uh, we joke now about all that. They know. Um, but uh, yeah, so they booked me against Mike Quackenbush, who was the style that I wanted to do, and so it was that was my big breakout match was September of the 2006 at the IPW Junior Heavyweight Title uh, for the tournament. Sorry, tournament, and that was uh, I think got match of the year for IPW. Um, but I just showed everybody that I could keep up with one of the best American luchadors and Matt wrestlers uh, in the United States. And guys, again, young wrestlers, if you've not seen Mike Quackenbush's work, go watch. Fluid would be disrespectful to call him fluid. He is just sudden with everything, and it's so good the way he can transition in and out of stuff. And the fact that, that Billy here was keeping up with a Mike Quackenbush speaks volumes with really how good you were in the ring, Billy. It was okay. That's okay. I did my best. I did my best. So I always say I'm athletic. I'm just not ricochet athletic. So, um, but if yeah. you if you go down the list of guys that are currently on on TV today, Billy, you've worked a, a vast majority of them. I've worked quite a few. Uh, Seth Rollins, uh, John Moxley, Ricochet. Um. Uh, uh, who else have I been in there? Those are mainly the big ones that I... Nigel I, McGinnis. Nigel <laughs> McGinnis, yeah. So if Trip Cassidy is here, he'll always remind me of who I've worked in the ring because I, sometimes I forget. I just found out recently I was on a... On a and I didn't work him, but I was on a show with L.A. Knight before he was L.A. Knight. I didn't know that. Um, but as soon as I we were tagged in the same uh, Twitter post, I was like, oh my God, I know exactly who that was. Um, so yeah, so, uh, that was kind of cool, but yeah, um, yeah, IWA and, and IPW, um, and then, uh, once, uh, once everybody saw that, I started getting work, work a lot of cool people after that. So. so you also had been given, how long did it take you to get the King of Indiana moniker? And before we dive into that one, I veer off here. I had heard a story where you had been called the nicest man in Indiana because you had drove a wrestler, I believe, across state mm -hmm. after a show because they did not have a ride home. Was that true? No, no. I, I have given, I have helped out many wrestlers, but not, um, I don't know the story you're talking about, but there have been many times where I have let wrestlers crash in my home, um, uh, Kyle O'Reilly is a name drop. That was another guy that um, I helped him, you know, let him crash at the home um, before a show. Um, there was another wrestler that a, a lot of it, I did drive Bull, Bull, uh, Bull Payne to a show once, but there's a lot of young wrestlers that I let them crash at my home if they need be or try to provide them a meal if they, they need one. 
So I'd, I'd always heard of all the the acts of kindness that you'd given to wrestlers, and it, that's rare because the 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 list of people, unless you're super close with them, the list of people that would do that is very slim. I, I just feel like it's uh, the right thing to to do. Um, just helping people out. If I trust you, if I trust you, then yeah. So. Yeah, well, yeah, you're letting somebody into your home. You better trust. Them. <laughs> but when but circling I, again, I wanted to make sure we fully detail covered the CWF days because one rivalry that was so important to the city of Lafayette, I think the state of Indiana as a whole, was your rivalry with Sean Cook mm-hmm. and just how good of chemistry the two of you had in the ring. And Sean is a phenomenal performer mm-hmm. in the ring. One of the absolute best heels. If you're going to research on any independent level, go find Sean Cook footage because he has really got the heel psychology down to an art. When did you guys really... Because you guys fought so many times. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We 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 fought for every independent promotion in Indiana, probably at one time. We tagged a few times on other shows. It was like the one or two times I was actually a heel. Um, and, uh, but yeah, um, to your point, Sean is an amazing heel. Um, and, and I think our styles work great because he's a heel, he's old school. The way he wrestles isn't anything real flashy, but he doesn't need that. His character is what's going to get him over. Um, and then there's me who just does babyface fire up, but, uh, I can do cool moves and Sean was able to take those cool moves. Um, so I think that's why it just worked so well, uh, with our feud. Now the King of Indiana. That was a moniker that you have earned. And I have talked to so many independent wrestlers while doing this podcast and, and being involved in, in this great sport industry, professional wrestling. And they've all said the same. If NXT would have existed during your run, 100%, you would have been in the WWE. No questions asked. When did you hit that King of Indiana mark? So uh, the King of Indiana was something that I created. And so the story behind that is I was going through all my PWI magazines one day and I was I was in a feud with Sammy Callahan at IPW and we were wrapping that up. And uh, I think we we're going to do a ladder match. And that might have been the first time I came out with the King of Indiana t-shirt. I don't know if it was that match or the match before, but it was close to there. And so... Uh, anyway, I'm going through my magazines, and uh, there's a wrestler back when I broke in, and he'd been wrestling before that name, Reckless Youth, and he was the, um, he basically was like the Kenny Omega of 1997, 98. Like, he was the talk, everybody was talking about Reckless Youth. And he had a t-shirt that said King of Delaware, he had another one that said King of Indies, and it was black, and it had the white lettering, and I was like, that's what I'm doing. Uh, because I wanted to, my feud with Sammy was very physical. He's a very physical wrestler. And so my feud, I wanted to show a little bit of arrogance. So I came out with that shirt. And then after that, I just, it just started becoming my own moniker. Um, some people were, I think, upset a little bit that I was just going out there randomly saying it. But I assure you, it, it was just a gimmick. Uh, I just, uh, I just said it just to show it basically to show arrogance. If people were offended by or upset about it, uh, maybe it worked, I guess. So, well, I, I don't, I, I don't think it was being arrogant. If you look at your body of work, no one like I, line them up. Who was doing what you could do in the ring? Respectfully, you were on a different level. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you for that. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I know. Um, yeah, I'm shy on those kinds of questions. <laughs> like I said, I, I, I was, I always wanted to be different and, uh, I knew being five foot five and the, the in shape, let's go with in shape, Billy rock, not now Billy rock where he has to cover completely up, but back in in shape, Billy rock, I was five, five. So I couldn't go up, grow up. And the most weight I could put on was like one seven. And that was, that was must must. That was as big as I could get. So I had to figure out different ways to try to get noticed. And that was like the European style. So adding some Lucha Libre and, um, 
Yeah, that's, that's it. Did did your height ever play a role in you not getting booked anywhere? Um, I mean, besides WWE, uh, probably, uh, other than that, no. But a funny story. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Roadhouse, and in that movie, Patrick Swayze has been was told like two or three times in in the movie, "I thought you would be bigger or taller, something like that," and I literally had promoters say that to me two or three times. So, so uh, I was like, "Yeah, that's what you got." <laughs> so. I'm already here. You've already paid me. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but then they saw my work and it was fine. But yeah, I, I got that a few times. What What would you say though, uh, a little teaching moment here, what, what would you say to the wrestlers out there that might be of a shorter stature? And by no means does that mean you should give up on becoming a professional wrestler. What, what would you say to those that might be self-conscious or struggling with that? So if you're a smaller wrestler, what, you know, obviously, you know, you, you can't go up. So one of the things I will, will tell smaller wrestlers is, is you do need to have the look and you do need to have some muscular. I, I think you should have a, a decent body on you. If you, if, especially if you're not real athletic, I think you, you need to have a good look. Um, so that's, that's one thing. So those are easy wins, right? And, and just working out. And then the, my next my next thing is uh, just work on promo skills because I can tell you right now, uh, for everything I was able to do in wrestling, I almost would trade it all if I could just been a better talker and had a phenomenal character. If I was MJF, uh, I would I literally would give everything up just to to have the attitude and and be ability to talk on the mic like MJF. So, well, with with everything that you had accomplished throughout the the indie circuit, what matches? That you that you fully remember stand out to you as ones that helped to define Billy Rock and what you were aiming to achieve in professional wrestling. Uh, definitely my match with Mike Quackenbush in two thousand six. Um, oh man, you got me on the spot on this one. <laughs> you know, the, my match with Sexy Sean Cook that that's the one that got that catapulted me to a, a level, another level. My my first match at IWA Mid South with Matt Seidel. That also put me on to another level. You know, I mean, I really liked my match with Osiris um, for BMF Wrestling 2008. I felt that put both of us. I mean, I still have, think that got us some not notoriety. Shoot. Um, yeah, that's all I can think right now. Like, we're talking about like, matches that I felt like put me to another level, I would say those. Um... I know you keep, you know, we talked about my, Nigel McGinnis, and, and that story is um, this promotion was having a tournament, and they brought in Nigel and Chad Collier, and it was uh, basically the tournament. The, 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 the first night was basically you, you set up the finals, and then the next show would be the finals. So that's where I wrestled Nigel, and I, I mean, we, I think we only did like 10 minutes, but I will tell you, say this. This is wrestling Nigel. This is where I learned, like, more psychology. Like, don't do something just to do something. And so, like, I wanted, I so wanted to have a British style match with him. And he's like, "That's not happening." He's like, "If you look, he's look at look at me. I'm a bear to you, all right." So, uh, the and the match was was fine. He was absolutely right. Like, we shouldn't be doing any of that. And it was literally like a, a cat and mouse type game. You know, the big man, little man, he tries to get me. I do something cutesy to escape him. And so, and I, um, so I always remember that. He's like, because sometimes as a wrestler, you want to get your stuff in. And then it just doesn't, it doesn't fit the narrative of the match at all. So you really have to think, yeah, he's right. This isn't, I shouldn't be doing that at all. Say on that match, that, that match with Osiris mm -hmm. for BMFX in 2008. Yes. You, on a prior episode that we had done, said that you wanted to make that the death of Superman. Yes. And by God, it was. I, I had the, the great fortune of being the referee for yep. that match. And I remember by the midway point, my referee shirt was covered in your blood. Mm -hmm. And the, the fans, Billy... Right here. Yeah. What go through that match because that was your send off from mm -hmm. that company. Yeah. Uh, 
long story, like kind of long story, I'll cut me short, but uh, I was going through a lot of stuff at that time. That was in July um, of 2008. My wife was seven months pregnant uh, with our first and only child. And I had just found out probably a month prior that my dad had terminal cancer and only had like six months to live. So I was processing all this and I just felt overwhelmed with wrestling and I needed to just kind of step back. So uh, I was the BMF champion. So what any good champion does, you help build up the next person. And so, you know, we knew it was going to be Osiris. And so I, 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 being a comic book nerd, I, and it was, and when I say death of Superman, that was my inspiration for it. And I don't want anybody to think, oh, he thinks he's Superman. No. Well, in Lafayette, that is my home. That is my hometown. A lot of family. So it kind of is the, the situation. And so I wanted everybody to see that the valiant baby face does not come back from the story. Like he is gone. And uh, kudos to Brian for getting an ambulance. And, uh, I had people blowing up my phone from other areas asking if this was real or not. And I think that's the definition of a great match is when people are not sure what just happened. And so I, I am proud of that match. There, there's another match, and I forgot to mention this. Uh, I, we did a, for IPW, I did a 30-minute Ironman match with John Moxley that had, was... Uh, Falls count anywhere, no rules, and it was not filmed, and nobody will ever see the light of day. So that's another fun story. So, uh -huh. and another, the other thing is, Billy, even during your active status for independent wrestling, you were such an inspiration and a role model for so many wrestlers, and you influenced so many. Um, one that comes to mind immediately is Jeremy Hadley. Mm-hmm incredibly influenced by by your work in the ring and jeremy by all accounts is one of the greatest heels you're ever going to see he gets it yep oh absolutely he gets it uh jeremy one he's he's funny he's hilarious he cracks me up all the time um uh, but once again when i talk about characters and personalities uh in my opinion jeremy is one of the best um he he absolutely he gets it he knows how to push buttons um, and the other thing is too, right? Jeremy can actually go in the ring. I don't know now. I haven't seen him wrestle in a while. He's also hitting, he's been wrestling forever now too, uh, which I can't believe. Uh, cause I remember these, these are days of where I, like, I remember his very first day of training and stuff, but, um, yeah, he's absolutely, um, he, and he, he was actually one of my favorite opponents to wrestle as well too. Cause he was always open to doing stuff. Um, and then I would always feel crappy because I remember one time I actually punched him in the face. And I didn't mean to. So he knows exactly the, the match because we joke around about it. But, uh, yeah, no, he's, he's awesome. How does it make you feel, Billy, to, to look back at that point in professional wrestling in your career that people were starting to look up to you and take inspiration from your uh, advice, your guidance? Uh, it meant a lot. Like I've always felt like I, I always felt like that was that's something I'm very passionate about. Is help trying to guide younger wrestlers, and so um, it is. It's, it's an absolute honor, um, you know. And I think in wrestling, it can be very hard uh, sometimes with veterans uh, not liking or making you pay that respect in physical ways or in demeaning ways. And I went the opposite direction. Don't get me wrong. There'd be times I'd be pissed and, and I might be at physical. That might happen. But it was never in a, like, I'm going to, like, break your arm type way. And um, I, I, and my students will tell you, my wrestling students will tell you I yelled a lot, but I never demeaned them. And that was always important to me, too. Like, because I wanted them to be the best, and I think it's important. I know some trainers will like give silly nicknames to people, and I never like that. I always want to make sure I call them by their name and show them that kind of respect. And um, uh, so, yeah, anyway, long story short, yeah, it, it means a lot. Let's say, and again, when did you, as we kind of, I know we're jumping around here. That's part of the charm. If anybody <laughs> ever watched this, we jump around. But when did you know? It was time to hang it up. When when did that thought start to enter your mind? Uh, when when my daughter was born and uh, when my dad passed away. 
uh, which was very overwhelming. But when my dad passed away, my daughter, uh, because so growing up, my dad, to understand this, uh, my dad never missed a ball game. And he literally uh, took less money at his job because uh, he was an iron worker. And he could have made more money had he traveled uh, outside the state all, all over. But he was always such a huge family man. He always kept within a 60-mile radius of home. So he was home every night. And he never missed a ball game. He never missed practice. Um, so that, like, I grew up with that. And so I didn't want to do the same thing uh, with my daughter. I didn't want to be on the road on a weekend for you know, a few bucks, um, trying to live a dream for a 10 minute match. Not to insult anybody who is doing that. That's great. It's just not something I was willing to do anymore. So that's when I knew. So you had several send offs because you were so prominently featured at so many different organizations and companies mm -hmm. out of all of them, Billy, which one do you, which one was the most special? Was it the final, final match or is it another one along the way on the way out? Nah, it was the final, final one. The final one with Trip Cassidy was the, the... So I had to... I consider my last match, like, I was done with everything in um, uh, November of 2016. I was done. Now, I have had three matches since then, but those are kind of just, like, just coming back just to say hi. And I have no issues with that when wrestlers do that. It's when they come back full time, right? So, um, so... But 2016, that was my, yeah, I'm done with wrestling. Doesn't mean, like, I don't still like it. Doesn't mean I won't be paying attention. But, like I said, my, my daughter had gotten really, uh, fallen, fell in love with softball. And that was a great decision because now I, I'm, I went from a traveling pro wrestler to now a traveling softball dad. So every weekend we're traveling somewhere for softball. A lot less bumps in that line of work. A lot less, but more. So I think it's more stressful. She's a pitcher, so it's a lot more stressful for me now. And I wanted, to, I wanted to say on here, it is so good to see, like, just how happy you are currently in life. Like, you are such a large part of her development in softball, and again, the dedication, not missing a game, being there for every step of the way, every bad game, every perfect game. Has she ever said, Dad, I, I want to try wrestling? Uh, so when she was little and there was a wrestling ring, yes. Now, absolutely not. She wants nothing to do with pro wrestling. So, uh, yeah, she was a little bumper back in the day. We had, had the crash pad out. She was doing front bumps and stuff. It was adorable. I'm, I'm sure that does not break your heart that she does not want to get into the business. No, nah, it's, it's probably just for the best. Just get an education and just do that. Develop that uh, fastball. Yep, just just exactly. Well, when you circling back here into that, that final match that you had against Trip Cassidy, what went into the decision to be uh, the match with Trip Cassidy, having him as the final opponent? Because... Billy, I'm sure you probably had a long list of people hitting you up for that final match. Yeah. So the original idea that was in my head for a split second was I was going to do a two hour long gauntlet match with every single student, but I didn't think that was going to sell tickets. So, um, and that's a true story. I really did think in my head, I was like, I can do this. Um, but anyway, uh, so Trip started it all. So he was the very first student of mine. Um, he um, and so and, and if it wasn't for Trip Cassidy, there would have been no School of Rock, uh, and that's that's the truth. You know, I don't know how far we want to dive into the training part of it just yet, but we'll anyway. give a a little teaser to part two. Here. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, Trip was the the one started it all. So I it was just just right that he was the one. We just ended it. So. Was there anybody out there that, like, I wouldn't say upset, but, like, maybe disappointed that you didn't have their match? Because a lot of people probably felt it should have been maybe you and Sean or or you and Chad. Um, I mean, you've had, God, so many opponents on independent wrestling that could have been fit the bill. But I, I commend you for, for picking Trip for everything that we'll talk about in part two. And... Trip is an amazing talent. He has went on to do some incredible things, all starting with your tutelage at the School of Rock. Would you say, looking back at that final match for Billy Rock, was that 
that sits well enough with you. Like that was, that was the greatest match to end it on. Uh, yeah. Besides one little botched uh, move that I had done a billion times, but I was I was getting old and out of shape at this point. Uh, besides that, yes, it was uh, it was perfect. Uh, students surrounded the rain while we did the match because we wanted it to be a. Um, uh, if you ever watched uh, SOR Class Wars, all the students are around the rain for every match. And so that's what we wanted to do there, too. Um, yeah. You know, and another thing is the reason why it was special is because my daughter was old enough to actually know what dad was doing. She'd been to others, but this one, she was old enough. So that was cool. And it was just Lafayette. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think it was when I was done, I was like, I'm done. I, I can't get any better than that. So. Let's see. You've held countless championships, been the face of countless promotions, helped so many along the way. And we're, we're going to get into exactly how many of those he's helped in part two. But what would you what would you say if you take the school of rock aside? Mm -hmm. What has been your greatest contribution to independent wrestling? Trying to really. Um... I, I think, uh, not, I don't know about so much about independent wrestling, but I will say Indiana, independent wrestling. And that is trying to get away from, uh, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but I don't want, the early days of when everybody thought wrestling was this way, and I was the one saying, no, wrestling can be this way, and we can do this and this and this. And then you get people that look at you like you're weird and I'm like, no, it's it's fine. This is where we're going. And um, that's what I think. I think I, I hopefully I feel other people feel the same way that I was the one that kind of helped um, say, you know what? We don't have to be exactly like the Dick the Bruiser era. We can do cooler stuff. We can do what the East Coast is doing. We can do what the West Coast is doing. We can do that. And so I, I like to think that's my part in, in, in Indiana independent wrestling. I don't think anybody would disagree with that contribution. Again, like you wrestled to anybody's style. You would give any hardworking wrestler the shirt off of your back to help them a, a stay in your home, a, a meal uh, to help out. Billy, you were one of one. Like, <laughs> on, honest to God, Billy. I mean, it, it, to sit back and look, because... So many people, they, every state has their version of a Billy Rock in it that is a top wrestler. But in wrestling, not everybody is who they say they are. Billy, and, and this is, I'm not kissing his butt because he's sitting next to me, he's my friend. But honest to God, Billy Rock, you are as advertised, a, a genuine as can be, and incredibly willing to help those in need. I, I try my best, and... and... I don't like to be put up on that level because I am human and I do make mistakes. And, and, and while you do talk me up, there has been times where I've made wrong decisions to people that I considered friends and, and I regret those decisions. Um, but I always, you know, at the end, I, I try to own to miss my mistakes and, and try to do the right thing and, and treat people with respect. And I think that's the big thing is just trying to just treat people with respect. Well, we're going to go ahead and cap this first part on, we'll end it on respect, which will be a great way to start the the next chapter. Uh, the School of Rock will be the second installment to this two part of the great Billy Rock's career. And guys, hopefully you've enjoyed this first part. Uh, again, in the comments on YouTube, let us know, say hi to Billy. Uh, let us know what your favorite match was of Billy throughout his career. And if you're listening to on Spotify, iHeartRadio, thank you guys so much for taking time from your day to make us a part of your day. We really appreciate it. And we will see you back here for part two coming to you real soon, guys. Everybody out there, take care.